All over Africa, the new military technology of automatic guns gave easy victories to the invaders. Countless resistors died. Many thousands at the single battle of Omdurman in Britain's conquest of the Sudan. Meanwhile, in another part of the Sudan, the French were also scoring victories. For the most part, public opinion rejoiced. For were these not victories over an inferior species, a kind of joke humanity? There were some critics, but not many, and their voice was ignored or silenced. What really mattered was to do down one's European rivals. If you were British, to get the better of the French in West Africa or of the Germans in East Africa. While orphans like little Uganda were left on the protective doorstep of Father John Bull. Even before 1900, there came a new source of conflict, settlers from Europe. French in the far north, Dutch and then British in the far south, and some Germans. Other settlers were attracted to the good farming land of the east, to Tanganyika, northern and southern Rhodesia, and the British territories of Uganda and Kenya. Once again, nobody asked permission. An early French governor had laid down the golden rule. Wherever good water and fertile land are found, he said, settlers must be installed without questioning whose land it may be. The settlers, not surprisingly, agreed. Not surprisingly, agreed. That's uh, what the enterprise became, in a sense, making way for the settlers. Now, the settlers were in the areas that he described, but not universally in West Africa. In fact, not at all in West Africa. And Kwame Nkrumah famously said at one point that um, it was the <clears throat> Anopheles mosquito that deserved a statue, in part because malaria made it impossible in the minds of Europeans for large-scale settlement to take place. Instead, conquest took the form that was really quite brutal. And pictures like this stayed in my mind for years. In part, there was something troubling about this picture in the 1984 film that I didn't recognize immediately. Um, but eventually, it came to me because it came from my book. I had done a study on the resistance of the Baule to the French occupation. And I was in Ivory Coast when the book was published. So I hadn't seen it myself. It was published in fact in 1980. And I was back doing field work um, when the Clarendon Press brought it out. And Basil Davidson got hold of it and used not only the pictures, but some of the chapters in it um, from the time it was published in 1980 uh, to when I got back in teaching in the anthropology department in 81 at Yale. I dedicated the book, or I should say, I placed the inscription at the beginning of it from an artist, if you want to call writers artists, who depicted what was going on as Basil Davidson, not many people objected. Some did, but not many. Uh, in his framing of it, the majority of the populace was in support of this kind of thing. But Conrad noted in the heart of darkness that the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those with a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. That's what I put at the beginning of the book because what I was looking at was the not very pretty thing of conquering these peoples who were using revolutionary war muskets in effect to try to resist the European advance with machine guns and with Senegalese troops. Uh, the French employed Senegalese and proceeded in the Ivory Coast with a whole series of very audacious and uh, destructive 
military actions, which in effect left a huge legacy. Hundreds of thousands of people are displaced and or died. Now we don't actually have a good reliable figure in terms of deaths, but the vast majority died from malnutrition and starvation because the tactic the French used eventually, and why it took them 22 years to, to accomplish this in the central part of the Ivory Coast, uh, was largely one based on agriculture. The Senegalese were in effect fed by rice, but rice was not grown in this part of the Ivory Coast at the time. And the local populations lived on yams and plantain bananas. Ultimately, the French uprooted local crops and burned villages to the ground in this particular campaign. And the result was really quite an impact, an impact which is documented but not written about very much. <laughs> uh, by that, I mean the documents exist, but they're not written documents, they're photographic documents. And it's really a rich a source of history of this period to start looking in detail at a digitized collection of these documents, because you can start to see who's involved and what's involved in these kinds of relationships and analyze them closely um, in terms of expressions and attitudes and positions in reference to power. Um, nobody's done a, an extensive study of this, but it could be done, I think, especially now with the technologies available um, and the narrative skill that has been developed by people like Ken Burns. Uh, I, I understand that's built into uh, the IMAC versions of various things. The iMovie allows you to do narrations as he did with the Civil War with these kinds of photos in such a way that you could do and almost approximate that, what I thought was really quite artful presentation by Basil Davidson in the era before Ken Burns, right? He's doing it physically with real tape and real film. I don't know quite how he accomplished it, but with these still photos, we could do a lot to look at things, including looking at local um, textiles that were used quite often in building and food supplies. Here is what you can get a sense of the uh, food supply that was used by local populations, plantain, bananas, and yams um, that is up against the rice of the conquering French and their Senegalese supporting troops. Now, why is rice important as opposed to yams and bananas? Well, on the basis of um, the fact that it's desiccatable, you can carry it further. You don't have to carry around yams and plantain bananas um, to feed yourself. You carry around dried rice, add water and stir. Every army in the history of humankind has been based on a desiccatable food supply. And ultimately it means that you're far more mobile. In addition to being better armed, you can move quicker and move longer. That is to say, cover longer distances. Um, this is ultimately what did in the local uh, resistance struggle. The agricultural aftermath of the bloody colonial conquest is worth, worth looking at because the Ivory Coast was not attracting white settlers, unlike Kenya. Uh, and you heard the ten, um, Tanzania efforts in the northern, southern Rhodesia and South Africa and in Algeria. Uh, the way Basil Davidson characterizes it, settler populations became an issue elsewhere in Africa, but not so much in the Ivory Coast. In effect, the result in agricultural terms was a long and laborious transformation of the colony's total range of agricultural practices, and in fact, the entire ecosystem upon which this part of West Africa had had in the past known for thousands of years. It was an explicit attempt to create an agricultural export economy without a white settler class. This is what sets the Ivory Coast apart from everything else in African history. Apart from the fact that there's no more ivory in the Ivory Coast, and it's the only part of the coast or all of Africa that's named after an object, right? That no longer exists there. Um, they're going to do it after 
military conquest through the promotion of cash crops. In part, this transformation was documented, even though it was not entirely written down. Much of the story was to be told through a careful reading of the photographic record. Okay, here's one of the reasons why there's no ivory left there, because very early on, the elephants were um, <laughs> killed and forced into extinction. The other kind of natural extraction that took place very quickly was for large tropical timber, mahogany and formagier as it's called. And in this, the mechanization of the, any stage of the process, particularly after you physically cut it down, how are you going to get it out of there? Well, you'd have teams of people dragging it through the woods. And when you could introduce tractors, you could actually get a lot more out and get it down to the coast where you could cut it into long squares that fit into the hulls of ships more easily than the round squares. And all of this was done by hand, um, manual labor. It was then taken down to the coast and individuals would, in teams, join up to push this out over the surf to the waiting ships. The structures of European dominance in the area were not very substantial, all built on sand. You couldn't build very high. Eventually, they worked from ship to shore by trying to create rail connections. And with the help of the Senegalese troops, they mobilized local labor uh, to pull this off in such a way that you could transform head carriage, which was the way to get goods around the country before the rail system into rail systems. And here you can see two generations of it. This is kind of push cart rail that starts first. And then with real ties, a motorized rail system that gets put into place. The infrastructural investment in colonial extraction is crucial in the Ivory Coast. A lot of infrastructure had to be put in before any um, kind of extraction could occur because there were no ports. And when you could motorize that infrastructure, you could take out more. Initially, these trains were actually built as part of the military effort to suppress the revolt to the interior. For that reason, they were built quickly and on a narrow gauge, which was in the long run, not very wise because you couldn't put much bulk trade goods on a, on a train coming out with a narrow gauge. Why? Because you take a corner and the whole damn train will fall over if you're going too fast. Um, the gauge had to be much wider for commercial purposes, but it was built for military purposes in the first instance. And that just had to be a troop transport system. When motorized transport came in the form of trucks and cars, this allowed for a whole new kind of infrastructure to extract um, the cash crops that were being grown. And of course, enough surplus could be had to <laughs> have parties every once in a while, especially on the 14th of July, where the French insisted that everyone um, celebrate the Bastille Day um, as they were now part of the French Empire. The lagoons were largely dominated still by large <laughs> local um, canoes. The motorization of the inland waterways did not take place immediately and was challenged by those who dominated things in canoes like that. Very different from Senegal. Senegal had a deep water port and right on the edge of the port, it could motorize very small units to push trams around with goods. And they could start to bring down to the port mountains upon mountains upon mountains of what? Well, les arachides, peanuts. This is a, a country built on peanuts, a colony built on peanuts, I should say. And in effect, they could export masses even before sailing ships completely were displaced by um, motorized and uh, Steamships, um, basically what you've got is an, an extraordinary export economy based on a cash crop of peanuts. But in the Ivory Coast, it was an exogenous plant introduced from Brazil that the agricultural export economy uh, was to grow and flourish over the first century after conquest. Although there were attempts to encourage white settler farmers to migrate to the Ivory Coast, um, it wasn't very successful. And in the event, 
and eventually basically they gave up in the white settler class idea and began to realize they had to work with locals being planters, having been forced to become planters of exogenous crops they had never seen before and had no interest in consuming. They don't even know what cocoa uh, was for, why the Europeans were interested in it, let alone coffee, uh, which was brought in again from Ethiopia at this point um, to be another export crop. Uh, bananas were local, but they were expanded under control, largely of plantations owned by Europeans, but not on a scale as in other parts of West Africa, as in the Cameroons. But in any case, it was cocoa that became the dominant crop after the First World War. African planters came to dominate production of all of the crops, but particularly cocoa. And eventually, they organized themselves and they were cooperative and ended up militating for greater control and led to a movement for independence, ultimately in the 1950s. I'm skipping rather quickly over the narrative here to get you to realize that what we've got is a unidependent uh, economy, basically, um, all aimed at getting things out of the country. The independence movement basically didn't change the structure of that um, production. In fact, it enhanced it. It was brought out in its strength by the organization of cocoa farmers. And the Ivory Coast became the biggest single producing country in the world um, shortly after it became independent in 1960s. Not all of this, however, achieved was achieved um, by the improved status of agricultural workers. In fact, as you'll see, even quite recently, this is problematic, as we'll see. So the U.S. imports about 21% of the world's chocolate, and the average American eats over 11 pounds of it per year. This hardly comes as a surprise, considering how oversized candy bars are stuffed in every vending machine and store counter across America. But you might be surprised to learn that nearly every time you take a bite of that delicious sweetness, you have the hands of a child slave to thank. Yes, you heard me right. And the corporations most responsible for this horrendous practice are Mars, Hershey, and most of all, Nestle. If you're a fan of this show, you probably already know about my disdain for Nestle, which also happens to be the largest purveyor of bottled water worldwide. Because really, who could forget this? Hello, Abby. I'm Stephanie from Nestle. <laughs> yes, I was lucky enough to receive a personal response from their giant PR department after calling out the company's method of water extraction and privatization. Well, Nestle isn't just sucking up the world's water supply and selling it back to the poor chaps it's stealing it from. The corporation's also known for their chocolate monopoly and the slave labor that goes along with it. Nestle chocolate milk and powder aside, you might be surprised to learn that Nestle is the umbrella corporation that owns some of your favorite candy, including Kit Kat, Butterfinger, Wonka, Milky Way, Chunky, Smarties, 100 Grand, Baby Ruth, and even chocolate power bars. That's by no means an exhaustive list. To many, it's simply unthinkable that rewarding your child's sweet tooth has come at a devastating cost of another child's indentured servitude. Yet Africa's Ivory Coast produces more than half of the planet's chocolate, and the conditions on these cocoa farms there contain some of the world's most abysmal conditions for child workers. Shocking pictures of children working with machetes and hazardous chemicals. Some said they were held against their will, forced to work, and many told us they never get paid. UNICEF estimates that more than 200,000 children could be involved in some of the worst forms of child labor. Yes, at least 200,000 children are enslaved on the cocoa farms and the Ivory Coast alone. It's a country with no real laws against human trafficking. And as a result, children are being trafficked or outright stolen from their parents to work on the farms. These kids are around 11 to 15 years old and many times even younger. According to an in-depth CNN investigation, they are forced to do hard manual labor 80 to 100 hours a week and paid absolutely nothing. Most of the children slaving away their lives on the field had never even eaten chocolate and have no idea what the cocoa is even used for. They have machete scars from cutting the brush all day and are severely beaten or even killed if they try to leave. What's perhaps most disturbing is that this is still happening 13 years after Congress passed the Harkin Engel Protocol or the Cocoa Protocol in 2001. The bill called for public reporting by African governments to voluntarily certify that they had ended the practice of child labor. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Today, human rights organizations report that some of the provisions still haven't been met. And no surprise, it's the biggest corporations who refuse to comply. Okay, well, you get the idea. We, we didn't go through it. They, uh, 
in effect a an issue here that is being um, skirted by many uh, or just swept under the rug altogether, especially by large corporations and the conditions upon which they are obtaining um, some of the material they're, they're exporting. Now, this is part of the condition that was discussed and pointed out during the colonial period, warnings about the fallacies and dangers of colonial agricultural export economies were in effect um, pointed out by agronomists and historians and particularly African economists at the time. Some do attention to the devastation of the topsoils, uh, like this Dutch ecologist here. Uh, others drew attention, like Basil Davidson, to an, a whole argument that you could have a lot of growth with no development. Um, as he said, can Africa survive arguments against growth without development? For decades since independence, Africa has been told that it should seek trade, not aid. This was Henry Kissinger's favorite phrase and his approach to foreign policy in the third world. Don't look for aid, get involved in trade. The advice of all the multinational organizations, development banks and nations like the United States was to expand exports and lower tariffs for imported foodstuffs. The result of decades of following this advice has been very largely economically destructive and ecologically devastating leading many countries to become food import dependent countries as fuel prices have risen. Economic historians have pointed out for over half a century that the barter terms of trade systematically moved against the world's primary producers. Walter Rodney pointed this out and in fact emphasized it in a second book. Um, but he wasn't the only one. In fact, if you look at the dates on these things, in 1970, 21 years above more than that. Now, we are now, what, um, basically 51 uh, years ago, um, Walter Rodney's first book came out on the history of the Upper Guinea Coast. But his second piece came out two years later on how Europe underdeveloped Africa. And Anthony Hopkins produced an amazing compilation of what was known at the time. Um, in the, his economic history, West Africa in 73. But basically, they all agreed and, and pointed to the fact that the barter terms of trade, that is what you get in return for one ton of, of exported cocoa, systematically declines over time. Um, in part because the trade policies of Europe and the United States were so successful. That is, if you could get everyone to grow cocoa, the net impact of it was to glut the market with cocoa and drive its price down. This was a well-intended um, policy pursued by industrial countries at the time. While Africa's production has boomed, the output rarely benefited local populations, as we learned through studies like the wheat trap and <clears throat> seeds of famine. This is particularly true as imported food came to substitute for local um, uh, production and consumption of foods in Africa. All the imported food is directly tied in its price to ultimately the import cost of oil. Um, and as the prices of oil go up, the costs of the imported food go up, obviously. So we get cases here where people are in effect, as they're called, uh, planting seeds of famine. They're planting things for export. In this case, um, the, the cases in the Sahel were particularly egregious. They were exporting onions to the French market at the same time they were having to import foodstuffs. <clears throat> this is something that's continued to a large extent, and it's not likely to change in terms of the structure of the food system globally. Monsanto has disappeared. It's been bought out by Bayer, the uh, pharmaceutical firm, and we have a combination now of pharmaceutical and petro-dependent agricultural firms that are appearing, getting bigger, bigger and bigger. Um, and they're dangerous trends, not just for Africa, but for the global food supply in general. Uh, individuals who have lots of money are getting more and more into investing in farmland. The farmland grab, as it's being referred to, is now institutionalized. Places like Harvard, Spelman, Vanderbilt, they have their investment funds located 
in instruments that buy up land in Africa at this point, as elsewhere. And the problem is basically, is this much needed new investment or is it a neo-colonial land grab that's now occurring throughout much of the continent? 